The circle circuit is what is used in the modern anesthesia machine, which is a great design that allows us to essentially recycle gas through a circuit. Rather than constantly relying on a uh, steady stream of fresh gas flow, this circuit allows us to reuse and eliminate CO2 from our gas. We'll have a source of fresh gas flow into this circuit, but because this recycles all of the air, we only have to add as much air as is eliminated by our CO2 scrubber or um, is used by the patient or is vented off by safety valves in the circle system. This allows us to introduce way less volatile anesthetic into this system than if we were just wasting all the air that came in. These volatile anesthetics are expensive and they need to be disposed of properly so they don't contaminate the operating room and also not good for the environment. So the less that we can waste of the volatile anesthetics by sending them round and round through a circle, uh, the better. There are essentially seven key components of the circle system and we'll talk about each one of them. Uh, starting with the CO2 absorber, number one. This is important because it removes CO2 from this circuit and prevents hypercapnia. You will of course be rebreathing your own air, so the patient's here. You're going to exhale air and eventually it will end up going back into your system. And if you haven't removed the CO2 from it effectively, you will be rebreathing CO2. So this prevents that from happening. These CO2 absorbers have granules of chemicals that react with carbonic acid. So your CO2 is going to combine with water in the uh, CO2 absorber to make carbonic acid, H2CO3, effectively eliminating this CO2. So these chemicals are strong bases. Example, um, calcium hydroxide is the main component of most of these. So mostly this. And there are different formulations of CO2 absorbers. Um, some will have sodium hydroxide as well. Potassium and barium hydroxide absorbers have also existed, but they tend to produce more toxic byproducts. The basic reaction that occurs is carbonic acid plus sodium hydroxide making sodium carbonate, water, and heat. If there was rapid conversion of CO2 um, in this step, you would actually feel your CO2 absorber heating up because it's an exothermic reaction. And then you would take your sodium carbonate and calcium hydroxide to make calcium carbonate and regenerate the sodium hydroxide. This calcium carbonate is just an insoluble precipitate. And then this conveniently is the activator which is regenerated. There is a CO2 indicator added to the CO2 absorber that shows you how exhausted it is. And this is often ethyl violet. And it is usually colorless at high or basic pHs and then will become violet colored or purple when the pH drops. Um, the pH for this indicator is uh, 10.3 so when it goes below 10.3 you'll see it changing to violet and so how that happens is when carbonic acid builds up it will change the um, environment to be more acidic. And this starts to build up when there's no more base left to um, convert it. So that builds up when base absorber is used up. As a good rule of thumb, when you see about 50 to 70% of your absorber change color, that's a good time to be changing it. So change when 50 to 70% purple. 
And I just want to make a note about being careful with high gas flows. Careful with high gas flow. These absorber granules are intentionally hydrated with water, often in the range of 15% hydration. But when you have very high gas flows running through this CO2 absorber, that water will evaporate, leaving the uh, absorber dry, or you can say it's desiccated. The problem with a desiccated CO2 absorber is that it's more likely to produce toxic byproducts. Specifically, there is a reaction with this sodium hydroxide, predominantly with desflurane, um, but also a little bit with sevoflurane that creates carbon monoxide. We know that carbon monoxide is toxic to patients. The other problem is that um, this carbonic acid uh, that builds up, it relies on this reaction of the CO2 with the water to form the carbonic acid. So if there's not enough moisture in this CO2 absorber, it will not be able to effectively remove the CO2 and your indicator uh, dye also won't change color. The other thing is, if you have your fresh gas flow cranked way up, so say it's at 15 liters um, per minute the entire case, you're kind of wasting the intelligent design of this circle system because if you're if you're pumping 15 liters per minute in, that air has to go somewhere and it'll probably just leave out through the APL valve. And you're actually flushing so much air through this system that you don't even need the CO2 absorber anymore because you would just constantly be flushing this system with fresh gas that doesn't have CO2 in it. So after induction where you should be using high gas flows, like 15 liters per minute of 100% oxygen, um, you should turn your flows down so that you're actually using this circle system to the best of its ability. On the other side of the spectrum, there's concern that SIVO at very low flows will convert to compound A, which has never been shown to be clinically significant in humans, but does cause nephrotoxicity in rats. Uh, so there are people that won't use flows lower than one liter per minute. Next, we have our fresh gas inlet, which we've alluded to. So this is number two. If you watched the last video, this is the gas that comes from our common gas outlet on the anesthetic gas machine. Um, here, we'll, we'll just call it the fresh gas flow. And this is your mix of oxygen, nitrous air, or volatile from your anesthetic machine. In the circle circuit, the best use of this fresh gas flow is really just to be high enough to replace the losses of gas that are going through. So you'll need to replace any volatile anesthetic that's being absorbed by the patient, um, any oxygen that's being used by the patient, or any gas that's being lost out of your adjustable pressure limiting valve, um, or um, lost anywhere else in the circuit because of a leak. Next, you have an inspiratory unidirectional valve. That'll be here. And this ensures unidirectional airflow in the direction towards the patient, essentially preventing exhaled air from entering the inspiratory limb. So air coming back from the patient has to go this direction and will not go back through the inspiratory limb because of this unidirectional valve. So I'll draw that air coming through, going through the unidirectional valve into the patient. And then when air is exhaled, it cannot go through here because there's already an air column here and you're not going to pressurize this air column. Instead, it will follow the path of least resistance, which is out the expiratory limb. So that's the normal function of this. I'll show you what will happen if the valve is stuck open. And as you might imagine, you will still be able to deliver air, obviously, in the direction towards the patient. And then when the patient exhales, there's nothing blocking air from flowing backwards through this limb. So you'll have some air going backwards through the inspiratory limb, and then also air going through the expiratory limb. The issue with this is now you'll have this column of air in your inspiratory limb that's full of CO2. It also has slightly less oxygen in it than would be coming from your 
uh, fresh gas flow source. So now when you breathe in this air, you'll be sucking in CO2 again. I'll show you the end tidal CO2 tracing of this. And this is measured from this sample line about here in the circuit. And simply just shows you the concentration of CO2 in the air that flies past this area in the circuit. So when you breathe out, you'll see CO2. And then usually when you breathe in, you're bringing fresh air past this sample line and the CO2 measured there will be zero. However, when you breathe in this column of air that has CO2 in it, you'll see this slope off of CO2 instead. This is you're re-breathing this column of CO2 rather than breathing fresh air, which would normally happen. And then so you exhale again, you breathe out CO2, and then you start breathing in, but you're breathing in CO2 so it will drop gradually rather than abruptly, which would be normal. So this is your rebreathing CO2 from that inspiratory limb. Another thing that could happen is instead this being stuck shut. Now, if you're trying to deliver positive pressure ventilation from above, you won't be able to because the airflow will not pass this valve that's stuck shut. Or if the patient is trying to breathe in on their own, this will be negative pressure and you won't get any air. You also won't be able to draw any from the expiratory limb because it has a unidirectional valve that prevents air from flowing this direction. This brings us to the Y connector, which is right here. And right here on this diagram. So this is just the boundary of bidirectional gas flow. So you have unidirectional gas flow through your inspiratory limb down to the patient. You have bidirectional gas flow until you hit the Y connector going to the expiratory limb. And here, you're going to have unidirectional gas flow out, and here you're going to have unidirectional gas flow in. That means gas is flowing in both ways from the Y connector to the patient. And that is dead space. And we call this instrumental dead space. Dead space is where you have ventilation, but there is no gas exchange occurring. So obviously there's no gas exchange that occurs in this tubing. And it is a certain volume that's taken off of your tidal volume um, that is not contributing to gas exchange. Um, so imagine if the circuit was designed this way with a very long um, piece going to the patient, or imagine a very long endotracheal tube, you're going to increase your area of bidirectional gas flow. The circuit is intentionally not designed like this because this would be a very poor design and unnecessarily increase your dead space. So you want the Y connector to be as close to the patient as possible. There's also an expiratory unidirectional valve, which we've kind of talked about. This ensures that when a patient breathes in, air is only drawn from the inspiratory limb. It will not be drawn from the expiratory limb because that would create negative pressure in this limb and that will not happen naturally so air will flow in one direction down this limb and that is out through this valve that's normal if this valve was stuck in the open position you would be able to breathe in this column of air because there's going to be air that will flow back and replace it so you won't create negative pressure and so this column of air that's full of CO2 will be able to be rebreathed by the patient. So this is essentially the same situation you were in when you had uh, inspiratory unidirectional valve stuck open where you will rebreathe your CO2 and eventually what you'll see is that 
you'll have a higher baseline so you won't return to zero. Your end tidal CO2 will stay at five or eight or something and then eventually also it, it will creep up over time too because you're not effectively eliminating CO2 or you're not even sending this CO2 out and onto your CO2 scrubber because you're constantly rebreathing it from this expiratory limb. So the end result here is a higher baseline CO2 and also eventually higher end tidal CO2 as well. And then the opposite scenario where it's stuck shut, you'll be able to breathe air in or deliver positive pressure ventilation. And when you try to exhale, you will not be able to, and it will pressurize this column of air, and then your lungs will be pressurized, and then you'll end up with barotrauma from the increased pressure. There are, of course, a number of things that can cause high pressures in your circuit, but if you're suspicious that um, one of the valves is stuck shut, the solution to this would be to disconnect the patient from the circuit. On some anesthetic machines, you can actually see these valves. There's little windows in the top of the machine cut out so that you can see the behavior of them. So you'll see if they're stuck open um, or stuck shut, and that will help you with your differential. And I should have said um, with this open valve situation, if you see your um, end tidal CO2 going up and staying elevated, um, of course, this valve issue is a potential problem. It's also very easy for you to look down at your CO2 absorber to make sure that it isn't uh, fully exhausted. Because obviously when your CO2 absorber has exhausted its ability to absorb CO2, you'll start to recirculate your CO2 and it will you'll never see your end tidal tracing return to zero. And lastly, we'll talk about the APL valve here and your bag or your reservoir. 